Oh, they killed, they killed him as a surprise. <laughs> If there are those who would rather not use the Slido, who end up raising their hands, I might take questions from them. <laughs> <laughs> I always give in to peer pressure in the end, but I mean, I always aspire to make this Slido only and then fail, but we'll see. Anyway, welcome everyone to this event to celebrate the publication of this book, which for those of you who haven't got it, you can buy, I imagine at a discount, Yes. on your way out. Uh, there are plenty of copies, and I should warn you that the last time they had an event, which was last week, they sold out, so get yours early. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce, I mean, Meg and Lisa, you will know from the book, from uh, UCL, but also we have with us Gavin Barwell, Tory peer for Croydon, who was formerly Theresa May's chief of staff, and to his left, physically, is Sir Graham Brady, <laughs> Conservative MP for Altrincham and Sale West. The way we're going to work this is... Meg's going to show us a short, a short video. Following that, Meg and Lisa are going to give us a brief pricey of the book. I'll turn to our eminent politician and former politician for some comments, and then hopefully we'll have a discussion. And keep your questions, if you get your questions in on Slido, it's a very good opportunity for me to pose them to the panel. And for those who don't, who have hands in the air, we might get to you later if we have time. OK, brilliant. Without further ado, Meg. This is just to get you in the mood. I'm very clear Brexit does mean Brexit. The sovereignty of Parliament and its restoration is at the very heart of why the UK is withdrawing from the European Union. Those of us on the Remain side might not like the result, but we have to accept it. The Prime Minister yesterday said she was calling a general election because Parliament was blocking Brexit. But three quarters of MPs and two thirds of the Lords voted for Article 50. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not true, is it? I don't say that this deal is perfect. It was never going to be. That's the nature of a negotiation. It's a wonder that any democratic politician could conceivably vote for this deal. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. Every day that passes without this issue being resolved means more uncertainty, more bitterness and more rancour. This horrendous debate, which is tearing the country apart, is doing great harm to our political institutions, and particularly Parliament. We have a divided cabinet, we have a divided parliament, we have a divided country. All the existing rules of politics have now been broken. The prorogation is completely routine. The decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful, void and of no effect. This Parliament is a dead Parliament. Yes. Yes. It should no longer sit. Many of us in this place subject to death threats and abuse every single day. I have to say, Mr Speaker, I've never heard such humbug in all my life. I would respectfully say my right honourable friend is tiptoeing onto a dangerous path. He's pitting Brexit against Remain, Young against Old, Scotland against England and people against the Parliament. how heated and how difficult this period of British politics became. Um, and Meg and I wrote the book aiming in large part to explain the twists and turns of what happened and to dispel some of the myths that have grown up around it since. And it's a story that begins with the growing backbench movement for a referendum, you know, particularly, of course, under David Cameron, and then goes on to take in minority government, two Supreme Court cases, some dramatic parliamentary defeats, uh, the fall of Theresa May and rise of Boris Johnson, an unlawful prorogation of Parliament, and it ends in our telling, at least, because we have to stop somewhere, uh, when the UK formally left the EU uh, in January 2020. But to understand this story, we really have to go back to the roots of the referendum itself. Um, it was called to try to resolve a long-running tension within the Conservative Party. Uh, David Cameron, encouraged by his victory in the Scottish independence referendum, hoped that a decisive Remain victory might quiet the Eurosceptic wing of his party, at least for a while. 
And he wasn't the only one who thought you know, that, that that calculation made sense. There were others in the party who weren't necessarily Eurosceptic themselves who supported the idea of a referendum. Um, in some cases, you know, partly under, under pressure from their constituency associations, um, but also because they thought it might, as one person we spoke to put it, lance the boil within the party. This is not a wise way to call a referendum. Um, and you know, that was picked up on by one Commons committee, um, chaired itself by Bernard Jenkin, a Conservative Brexiteer, um, who critically called this a bluff call referendum. And one consequence of this was that it was ultimately called on an unclear prospectus. There was no real preparation done for a leave result. And this laid the ground for so many of the problems to come when Parliament was given the task of interpreting the result. After the referendum, of course, David Cameron stepped down. Theresa May swiftly became Prime Minister. And her position in the party was quite tricky from the start. Um, the joint implosion of uh, the Johnson Gove ticket in 2016 um, added on to the very bruising experience of the <coughs> referendum campaign itself, left the party feeling quite traumatised. Um, and uh, May was chosen in part as a kind of a reassuring option, you know, a competent politician who knew the party well. Um, and Amber Rudd, um, in an interview with UK and Changing Europe, um, referred to this as being like holding nurse's hand uh, mm. after a really difficult period. But that wasn't the same thing as having a really deep bedrock of support and enthusiasm um, for Theresa May, and she ended up in a difficult position. Uh, the ERG in particular um, was at times suspicious because of her backing for Remain, albeit mm. that had been quite low key during the campaign. Um, and under pressure, May drew red lines uh, that boxed in her room for manoeuvring the negotiations. But meanwhile, some others in the party who had been Remain supporters started to get concerned about you know, what they saw as potentially a closed style, a no running commentary um, approach, and started to push for Parliament to have a more active role in overseeing the negotiations. So the seeds of later difficulties, some of these things that would become very evident in kind of late 2018, early 2019, were, were there almost from the start. And then the 2017 general election made things far more difficult again. Theresa May lost her majority and she was fatally weakened within her own party. There was real uncertainty for a while about uh, whether she was going to be ousted as party leader. And of course she was weakened in parliament. The new parliamentary arithmetic was by no means in her favor. Um, she had no real hope of being able to you know, choose one wing of the party, choose one competing policy prospectus and freeze out the other. She needed to keep her whole party and her DUP partners on the side. That was immensely difficult to do. That could have pointed naturally to moving toward cross-party working. But actually, cross-party working is very difficult for a prime minister who has lost their authority within their party, or at least you know, lost a significant degree of it. And Labour was in a mess over Brexit. Um, its constituencies had split between Remain and Leave. Uh, that made coming up with a Brexit strategy a real challenge. And there was a Jeremy Corbyn problem. Uh, he was an uh, unpalatable partner for many Conservatives. And he lacked support in his own parliamentary party, which had tried to oust him uh, in the weeks after the referendum and failed. But he was strengthened by the 2017 election, unlike May, so there was no realistic prospect of him going anywhere. So this created a very unclear path forward. And at that point, I'll hand over to Meg. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, that was chapters one to five uh, <laughs> in five minutes. Uh, I'm going to try and do chapter six to ten. Uh, so after the 2017 election, uh, roughly a year after the referendum itself, um, talks with the EU began in earnest. That's when Gavin joined number 10, and his own excellent book emphasises that it was only really then that key dilemmas, particularly over Northern Ireland, began to be recognised. Meanwhile, Parliament was more polarised than ever. On the Labour side, many began hoping Brexit might be overturned via a second referendum, while others were in favour of a soft Brexit. Some hardline Conservatives were energised by Theresa May's rhetoric about the threat of no deal, while many other Conservatives increasingly feared it. Various backbench groups developed, both within and between parties, to press for different outcomes. In July 2018, Conservative splits came right into the open when David Davis and Boris Johnson resigned from the Cabinet over May's Chequers proposals. When the deal was agreed with the EU that November, Dominic Raab, Davis' successor as Brexit Secretary, and three other ministers resigned. This made it seem obvious that the House of Commons wouldn't support the deal. But it had to be consulted thanks to Dominic Grieve's amendment to the EU Withdrawal Bill to require a so-called meaningful vote, 
Greaves' move was motivated by desire to avoid a no-deal Brexit, but ironically it provided a vehicle for the hardline Brexiteers to block the deal. When debate began on the deal, the first Conservative backbencher on his feet was Boris Johnson, as we just saw in the video. On that first day of debate, six of the 12 back, uh, Conservative speakers opposed the deal. The next day, 13 out of 19 did so. The vote was pulled and rescheduled to January, but ended with the heaviest de uh, Commons defeat on record. 118 Conservative MPs opposed the deal in this vote. Strikingly, 90 of them had been Leave supporters in 2016, while 49 former just 49 former Leavers supported the government. Former Conservative Remainers overwhelmingly backed the deal by 144 to 26. May naturally attacked the opposition for not supporting her deal, but Labour had its own splits and no desire to expose them by backing the Prime Minister in a fight not of its making. The key place for government to look for support was on its own back benches, and particularly from Leave supporters, but that's exactly what was missing. This pattern repeated in two further votes on the deal in March. By the end, there were 34 Conservatives holding out, dominated by the 28 ERG Spartans, if they and the DUP had supported the deal, it would have passed. One of the biggest problems we identify in the book is that May never spoke up about the problem created by her own internal hardline opponents. After the second defeat, her ill-judged I am on your side speech from Downing Street instead blamed a generalised parliament for blocking the deal. At that point, the Brexit-supporting newspapers would have backed her against the hardliners, They'd noticed what was going on. In, in response to the second defeat, the Sun suggested that Tory Brexiteers who rejected the deal have lost the plot, while the Daily Mail proclaimed that these Tory wreckers will not be forgiven. But May didn't capitalise on this. Her instinct seemed always to be holding her party together at all costs, even when elements of it were undermining her. This served her badly and resulted in our institutions getting blamed. Ironically, Boris Johnson, having voted twice against her deal, denounced May's Downing Street words, suggesting that it is wrong in every sense to blame MPs for blocking Brexit. Of course, he'd later be elected on a manifesto that did exactly that. Her words, sadly, also helped to feed the idea of proroguing Parliament. On May's watch, Conservative MPs were often central to attempts to find alternative solutions. The Brady Amendment, which Graham might discuss, achieved a temporary truce in the party, but unfortunately to no lasting effect. Twice, Caroline Spellman successfully proposed amendments allowing MPs to express their collective opposition to no deal. Oliver Letwin led attempts to get other Brexit options debated. Both of them had consistently supported May's deal. When Letwin's intervention facilitated the so-called indicative votes, the two key soft Brexit proposals also came from Conservatives who'd supported May's deal. Ken Clark and Nick Bowles. When those votes failed, criticism again pointed to former Remainers on the opposition benches for being fragmented. But the far greater factor was that only 30-something Conservatives voted with Clark or Bowles. Others on the platform may explain this, but again, it seemed that holding the party together and protecting Theresa May got in the way of actually finding a solution. When Johnson took over, that abruptly ended. We saw the prorogation and the stripping of the whip from 21 Conservatives who supported fresh moves to block no deal. Johnson's cabinet contained various figures who'd repeatedly opposed May's deal. In contrast, most of those he expelled had supported it. Johnson's key success, where May had failed, was bringing the ERG hardliners on board for his deal. But as we discuss in the book, it seems he only did so by promising privately he'd renege on the Northern Ireland Protocol afterwards. This is, of course, before he went on to sell the deal to the public as oven ready and on a manifesto that blamed MPs for thwarting the democratic decision of the British people. So summing up, we set out to write a book about Parliament and Brexit, a story ostensibly which appeared to be about a clash between institutions, Parliament, government and the courts. But in fact, we conclude, Brexit was above all else a battle inside the Conservative Party, for which Parliament all too often got the blame. <coughs> Thank you very much, both of you. I should just say the book is a wonderful, wonderful read, apart from being very interesting, so I really do recommend it to you.
Turning to you two, I mean, do you have any immediate comments on what you just heard from... I mean, I've got hundreds of questions I could pose to you, if, if not, but uh, do you have any immediate comments on what you've just heard? Well, I imagine for Gavin as well as for me, it was really quite traumatic just getting that through. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't agree that it was all about the Conservative Party. I think there was a, there was a big outside pressure, and that was part of the pressure on the Conservative Party, but it was an outside pressure as well. And um, you know, I suppose the, the other observation at the outset <coughs> that I'd make is to say that the, uh, you always have to remember in referendums there is a, a bias to the status quo. So you know, I think that result was quite remarkable. Um, and I think probably the political establishment generally underestimated that, the extent to which people had done something really exceptional mm -hmm. and the extent of the frustration that demonstrated. Um, I had a few, uh, quite a few thoughts. Just cut me off if I go on. No, sorry, go ahead. Uh, like Graham, I think the video was not pleasant watching. Uh, not pleasant um, I mean, I think Lisa and Meg have identified a number of the issues. Uh, to, to me, when I came in to work for Theresa after the 2017 election, the issue of the lack of clarity of people had voted to leave the European Union, but whereas the Remain side was Remain on the precise terms that David Cameron had negotiated, the nature of the relationship with the EU after you had left was undefined. And that, I think, was a huge issue because there was no... Different people had different views about what <coughs> people had voted for. And the truth is, no politician could say with certainty other than the people had clearly voted to leave the European Union. Um, the 2017 election, I think, then, is critical in changing the parliamentary arithmetic and leaving it so agonisingly balanced that actually... Uh, the indicative vote showed that there was no version of Brexit that Parliament would support. And indeed, once Boris Johnson took over from Theresa May, he was unable to get what he wanted through Parliament. And he was able to change the arithmetic. Theresa, having, having tried that trick once, couldn't go back and try it again. And I don't think it just weakened her authority within the party and within Parliament. I also think, critically, it weakened her authority with the EU mm. as a negotiating tool. Um, I also agree with what you said about the difficulty of, of working cross party. I mean, I don't know what Graham's thoughts are on this, but I think our adversarial system doesn't naturally lend itself to cross party deals in the way that you often see in many European um, democracies. And it was certainly made more difficult by Jeremy Corbyn. You could tell right at the end of Theresa's time when she tried to talk to Jeremy Corbyn, there were plenty of people in the Conservative Party who had supported her up to that point who found the fact of talking to Corbyn to be unacceptable. Um, then I think, um, so three, three quick sort of final thoughts. One of the problems we had, and I, I don't, I don't uh, I'm not complaining about this, I think it's entirely legitimate, but the way Parliament works and people's ability to amend motions meant that you could never force a binary choice between Theresa's deal and X, whether X was no deal or a second referendum. So actually people were always splitting between multiple different options and that made it impossible to assemble 50% plus one for the deal. I'm pretty confident that if you could reassemble here tonight all of the MPs who were in that parliament and say, would you rather Theresa's deal or the deal we've ended up with, somewhere in the region of 450 to 500 would choose Theresa's deal. Yeah. But many of the, the, the problems she had, and Graham is very well aware of this, is she was trying to sell a messy compromise. And actually, of those 400 to 450 to 500, many of them would have preferred something different to her deal. They might have preferred it to Boris's, but they didn't really like mm. the compromise she was um, selling. My biggest sort of regret, and, and this ship had kind of sailed before I arrived, but I think one of the other problems we had is we never faced up to what the real choices were. Lots of people in our political system continue to believe, and they still are, there's still people in the GDP who are saying, I want a version of Brexit where the whole UK is treated the same. And the, the reality is that unless you want to stay in the single market and the customs union, that doesn't exist as an option. So there's still people that are not facing up to what the real choices are. Uh, and then um, final thought would be on the meaningful vote, where I thought you made a really good point. It was obviously designed because there was a fear that the executive would try and bounce Parliament into the deal with some sort of one-off small vote and there wouldn't be proper consideration of all the deal. I don't actually think, I don't think the Conservative Party would have allowed the government to do that and I don't think Theresa would have tried to do it. But anyway, the effect of the Meaningful Vote Amendment was to basically say 
you had to have a yes vote for the whole package before you could go through and consider the legislation in detail. Before we could bring an actual bill in, mm-hmm. taking the treaty through, people had to approve the whole thing. And that made it so much harder, because actually, if you've done it the other way around, if you brought the legislation forward, some of the specific questions about what's Parliament's view on customs union or what's Parliament's view on this or that would have been resolved in the passage of the legislation. And then at the end, you would have seen whether the amended bill, as it had got to at that point, had majority support in Parliament or not. So I think that the people that put that amendment from Union for Vote Through did so with the best of intentions, but actually had the opposite effect of what they were trying to achieve. I'll stop there. I could go on. Interesting. I don't, I don't know if this is a reflection on me, but on as I read the book, all the questions that occurred to me were basically what-if questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm absolutely obsessed by the what-if questions, and I don't want to go too far down the road, but just one slight what-if question. Were you both surprised that so few Labour MPs backed the May deal? No, I, I don't think I was. And uh, I mean, you, You've got to... I, I know uh, Gavin uh, referred to the adversarial nature of politics in the House of Commons, you've got to add the fact that normal party politics continues uh, as well as there being a really big difficult thing to try to resolve. So you know, I think it would have been quite a, a remarkable thing mm. uh, for uh, the Labour Party to come in yeah. and, and help the Prime Minister out of that um, uh, situation. Um, uh, sorry, I was going to wander on to other things. No, you wonder if you want. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> one of the things I was going to, I was going to pick up away. Uh, was that, um, uh, of course, one of the points, Theresa May herself set a, a very, very clear position on what Brexit should be quite early on. Mm-hmm. And in the Lancaster House speech, she set out exactly what she wanted. Uh, and uh, that, I think, set a level of expectation uh, as well. And the uh, difficulties with amendments that, to which Gavin was... Uh, referring, I think the degree of, well, I think the politest way I can put it is procedural flexibility <laughs> allowed by the then Speaker uh, made life considerably uh, more difficult uh, because the normal procedural rules of Parliament uh, disappeared and suddenly you could just do almost whatever you wanted as long as the Speaker thought it was a good idea. And you know, I, I just think that was the point where we got completely into the, the, uh, the, the, the weeds and couldn't find a way out. I think on your, on your specific question, um, we nearly got about 10, 15 more on the third vote. Mm. Um, the, that, my most frustrating day of the whole thing was the day of the last vote. Because you basically had three groups who were wavering. You had the DUP, mm-hmm. who I, I don't want to speak for them, but I think their basic view was they got quite close to something they could live with. But their fear by that point was that even if it went through, there would probably be a change in the leadership of the Conservative Party and the bits of the deal that were domestic promises that Theresa was making to them rather than in the withdrawal agreement might get rescinded on. Mm. You had, you know, quite a lot of the sort of Eurosceptic right of the party came on board for the last vote. So Don Barr, yeah. Boris Johnson, people like that, Ian Duncan Smith came across and voted for it on the third deal. But enough, so Steve Baker, Suella Braverman, that group, enough of them didn't. Mm. to mean it couldn't get through and then you had this group of 10 or 15 Labour in peace and there was a meeting in Theresa's office on the day of the vote people were in tears I mean the Labour whips were very aggressive with their MPs at making sure that they didn't break ranks and vote with the government um, so I wasn't surprised because I was very conscious of the pressure they were and what they were saying to us bluntly I don't think they would mind me saying this at this point of time was <coughs> if our votes will make the difference between this going through and not going through we're prepared to vote with you. But given that it might be the end of our political careers, we don't want to do it just to go down in glorious defeat alongside you. Mm. So you've got to tell us if our 10 or 15 votes are going to make yeah. a difference. Yeah. And we had to be honest with them about that and say, you know, an hour before the vote, I don't think it is going to make the difference. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because, you know, we all talk about realignment, and, less to, and, and yet to a significant extent in, in Parliament, the story was one of party over realignment, wasn't it? That it's, it's amazing how how rigid those party structures for all the cross bench working and all that at the end of the day party loyalty was still remarkably powerful is that is that fair would you say uh, uh, can i just come in on what gavin's yeah. just said because i was looking for a quotation in the book you know which one it is don't yeah. you yeah. Uh, <laughs> about the third about the third vote which which you write about so well in your book as well um 
there were ver we, su we suggest that there were various groups that were in this position. So there were the, the very small group of conservatives who were still conservatives at that point, including Dominic Grieve, who were going through the same thoughts that if their votes were going to be enough, then they would join the government in but they didn't think they would be enough and therefore they may as well stick to, stick to their principles. You've got the DUP as well. Uh, but on the Labour side, yes, clearly they were under enormous pressure. Um, but the thing that you said at the start, I think is really, really important because it's not just fear of uh, the response from their whips and fear of voting for the deal and it not getting over the line. There was the fear of what if they did vote for it and it did get over the line. So we have this quotation from a Labour person who had been in that position, thinking of voting for it, um, who says there were a lot of people who didn't vote for Theresa May's deal because the presumption was it will be overturned by Boris Johnson. We don't have trust. It's a blind deal. Uh, it goes on a bit, and then it says the danger is you could vote for it, and then it will be overturned three days later by Boris Johnson becoming prime minister and doing something mad. So it was the fact that <laughs> Theresa May was so under threat by that point within, within the Conservative Party that was an additional obstacle. This is going to be a very triggering evening for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the blind deal thing drove me to absolute distraction because the reality was, legally, you could only negotiate the withdrawal agreement as a legal text and a political declaration about what the future relationship would be that would be turned into a legal treaty down the line. So it had to be blind. Uh, and people were saying to me, well, I'm not going to vote for it unless you get rid of this blind. And I'm like, we can't do that. That's not possible. And this is my point that you, you, often the tests you were being set are ones that you couldn't actually ever get over, essentially. Mm. But okay. the, the concern was passing the political declaration on to Boris Johnson, wasn't yes. it? Yes, and so, so yeah. the, more, the, more, the weaker Theresa's position became, and, uh, um, well, I write about it in the book, mm. by the part time of the third vote, she'd given a clear commitment that she wouldn't see through the second stage, that she mm. would try and get the yeah. withdrawal agreement yeah. through, yeah. and then there would be a leadership election. And she had judged, based on advice from, from Graham and from others, including myself, that that was necessary to maximise her chance of winning that vote. But the flip side of it was that the people that might have voted for her deal but were worried about it being trans... That, that commitment helped on the Conservative side, but it hurt her chances of getting some of the DUP and mm. Labour votes that she might otherwise have got. Do you want to, do you want to? I think we should come back to Alan's question about the power of parties. Well, no one <laughs> They normally come back to my question. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think this is this is a very good point because there are there are all these kind of calculations going on, and people are being asked to do something that's emotionally immensely difficult. You know, party loyalty is is strong for a reason. You know, MPs so, are socialised into their party you know, over long periods of time. They have personal loyalties, but there's a really interesting thing that's happening. I think particularly in 2019, where Party loyalty and expectations of the usual way that, that party works are still quite strong, but, but they're also breaking down in other ways. So you know, the whipping operations are no longer really able to determine what backbenchers are doing. But at the same time, there are still these sort of slight expectations about the roles that people will play in the Commons. So um, some of you may remember talk about a government of national unity um, in 2019, this sort of idea that um, the luminaries of the House of Commons might come together and um, you know, uh, essentially you know, replace avert, um, a Johnson premiership. And one of the reasons it falls down is that it's very difficult to decide who's going to lead that if it's not the leader of the opposition. But the leader of the opposition is not palatable <coughs> Yeah. to many other people who might otherwise be even in his own party even in his own party <laughs> so so there's a sort of attempt to break free of the usual party roles but also it's very very difficult to do that interesting i mean, it would have been very difficult to have a government of national unity that disagreed with the majority view of the british public yeah. expressing referendum as well yeah yeah interesting now i mean two of you are seasoned parliamentarians and two of you are seasoned parliament watchers and wh wh one question i wanted to ask all of you is just looking back at this whole period what has, has anything fundamental about your view of Parliament or the role of Parliament or the workings of Parliament changed coming out of this Brexit process? How is, how is your... You're looking at me. Yeah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Um, I've, always, I've always been a, sort of a cheerleader for Parliament and a cheerleader for... Um, the backbench voice and so on. And I mean, Graham and I go back to the, the right committee, uh, where I was the advisor to the right committee, and Graham was, Graham was one of the members, and that was all about empowering the backbenches and actually 
creating a, a culture where it was easier for people to work across party, where there, was in, there were incentives mm -hmm. to break away from the party boundaries and find alternative majorities through things like the backbench uh, business committee and strengthening, strengthening the select committees. Um, I think that this process does teach you that there are, that there are limits to how far you can take that. <laughs> Um, yeah. And that actually, that might be that might be a healthy check on a government that if there's if the government is keeping something off the agenda that a lot of MPs want to talk about, it's healthy to give M to empower MPs to be able to get that thing on the agenda. But if the government itself is not capable of constructing an agenda that has majority support on the burning political issue of the day, it's going to be beyond backbenchers to be able to sort to be able to sort that out. There are, you know, government is there for a reason, political parties are there for a reason, and when party cohesion breaks down to the extent that it did on Brexit, and I, I totally accept it was on both sides, but it was on the conservative side that it really mattered uh, because it was a conservative government, then parliament finds it very hard to function. So it sort of takes you back to the traditional way that parliament works, and the, it reminds you what political parties are for. They, they aggregate opinion, mm. uh, they, 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 they make collective decisions, and in those later stages, uh, through the indicative votes and so on, I mean, Gavin again and, and, and Graham as well may have views as to mm. what, what went wrong at that stage. As I said, there were only 30-odd um, conservative MPs supporting poor Ken Clark and Nick Bowles, who were trying to find a way through the middle. Um, but one of the things that was said to me by a well-placed interviewee was that there was a constant concern that actually if a majority could be formed that didn't have very many Conservative MPs in it, then Theresa May wouldn't be allowed to deliver the decision that had been taken by Parliament. Mm. So we think that Parliament is taking the decisions, but actually if the government isn't cohesive, it, it, you, you need the government to deliver on the decisions that are taken by Parliament, and she wasn't in a position to do so. I think you have to start by recognising the exceptional nature of the issue. I think that for, for quite a lot of the people involved, the issue was so important to them that it transcended their normal partisan, you know, sometimes MPs get criticised for this, I think, unfairly. Po politics is a team sport. Um, and we, we don't have a parliament of 650 independents. We, you know, Graham and I have similar views, but not identical views, and we sat together for seven years under the Conservative, when we kind of agree that we're a team and we'll come up with a collective position and we'll we'll try and support that position. And occasionally you might, if there's an issue where either your constituency feels strongly or personal conscience takes you in a different direction, you might take a different view for the whip. But this question <coughs> was so existential to quite a large number of MPs and, and was exceptional in that mm -hmm. regard. So I think you, I was going to make this point about indicative votes. I think you're right there was quite a battle within the government. Some ministers wanted the indicative votes to be free votes so that they could express their personal opinions on these questions. And others within the government felt that if that happened, that was essentially the end of collective responsibility and the government would no longer look like a functioning whole. But if you imagine for a moment that that, that had been allowed to happen, then I think certainly the customs union vote would have, there would have been a majority in Parliament for that. Mm -hmm. But the May government could not have delivered that as a policy because, you know, as we were struggling to hold sufficient numbers of leave supported Conservative MPs in the government as it was. If we'd shifted the policy to include support for a customs union of a traditional kind, then the government would have broken apart. Um, and, and so that's, I, I basically agree with Meg's conclusion that essentially, whilst the sort of whilst the thrust of the right reforms and strengthening the voice of the backbencher, the power of select committees, those were all good things, what happened in Brexit is that Parliament effectively became almost the government in some ways, it, it, or at least the government was governing a coalition with Parliament. And it was partly because John t took a view, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and be even more polite, I think he took a view that if the majority of the House wanted something, it was his job as Speaker to give it to the majority of the House. To, the, to such an extreme that if you had something that said this motion is unamendable, but a majority wanted to amend it, he would reinterpret the rule to say that it could be amended. And at that point, life becomes very difficult. Parliament wasn't very good at being a government, though, was no, it? No. No. Um, but which brings me back to the central point about procedure. And I, I think underestimating the extent to which Parliament depends on procedure, the where you bump up against the things that you just can't change because that's convention and it's accepted and everybody knows that's the rule. 
is when you actually have to be a bit creative and a bit accommodating and maybe start to compromise. And if you can start just bending all the rules or breaking all the rules, it doesn't work. I was going to throw in as well, I think one of the things that made this passage even worse uh, was the constitutional abomination that was the fixed term yes. parliament act. Yes. So you know, the normal kind of uh, things that would impact on members of parliament as they're thinking their way through all these things didn't apply. Is the government going to fall? Can the government say, well, if you do this, then we'll treat us as a base of confidence. We're going to go to the country. You couldn't do any of those things. And it was a part of the torture that we went through. And it really was just um, uh, painful. I can't tell you how awful it was for um, members of parliament, because you just could see no way through it uh, that would work at all. I, I was going to just mention a couple of One of the other problems, of course, is the original withdrawal agreement, as it came back from Brussels, um, was obviously something which was not going to enjoy majority support in the House of Commons. And uh, I, mean, I heard it briefed on the, on the radio, I think it was, and obviously pretty well briefed. It was very detailed stuff on the BBC. I asked to go and see Theresa straight away. And I just said, you know, if this is accurate, and I think it probably is, this will not get a majority in the House of Commons. And then when she sent some advisors over to brief me on it in more detail, and the more detail I went into, the more obvious it was that it wasn't going to get a majority uh, in, in Parliament. Um, then I was trying to persuade her not to go to the, to put it to Parliament for a vote, which was very obviously going to be defeated very, very heavily. And the, um, the whole point of that, that delay before Christmas, uh, was the hope that there would be a serious effort to try to get something different uh, that might actually get majority support. But instead, we ended up putting that uh, to the Commons and having the worst defeat in parliamentary history, which was a, a, a remarkable thing. And I, I suppose I just add on the issue of sort of party, party, party unity, but also uh, the effort to try to make progress. This is where uh, my amendment uh, was a, an effort to be constructive, find a way uh, forward that most people could coalesce around. And it was the only positive measure for Brexit uh, that actually won a majority in that parliament. Uh, and I think the majority was about 28 from, from memory. Uh, but the idea, funny, isn't it, how these things continue to, to haunt you? Um, <laughs> the idea uh, that you could proceed uh, with the withdrawal agreement, as long as you took away the political declaration and had, quote, unquote, um, uh, alternative arrangements at the Irish border. And you know, that was what we wanted. Um, and Parliament voted for it. Uh, but it wasn't actually then secured. <laughs> Just one sentence to add on. I mean, I think this point about fixed term parliament is so profound. So let me pose a what if to you, which is that if, if that legislation had not been there, the government at some point, not for the first vote, but at some point down the line, would have said this is a confidence mm -hmm. vote. Now, it's possible at that point the government would have fallen because mm -hmm. it's possible that the party would have said we're not prepared to allow Theresa to lead us into another general election. I don't know how that would have played out. But one way or another, it would have forced a resolution in a way that we were unable to do with the, with the law as it was yeah. there. Would not fear of Corbyn have worked in her favour at that point? Possibly. Sorry, the coffin is you two, not for me. Do you want to have a go at that? Well, I think you, you raised the very good, the very good question of you, know, you can, there's the potential of a confidence vote. There's also the question of whether the party would have allowed Theresa May to lead them into another election. So do you have effectively an arms race between a vote of confidence in the government and an attempt to oust the prime minister to avert the vote of confidence in the government? And the party potentially going into an election without a leader. Uh, you would have had to resolve that extremely quickly. I suppose maybe it would have been Boris Johnson. Um, but I think, think Lisa's right would have been resolved before. She, she either would have been allowed to do the confidence vote mm. or they would have tried to stop her doing the confidence vote yeah. in the first mm. place. Mm. I've never been convinced by... I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure whether this is what Graham is suggesting, but I've never been convinced by the suggestion that the threat of a general election would have pulled, basically, the Spartans into, into line. <laughs> um, Indeed, I did speak to one of those people at one time who suggested that they would have rather run as an independent than fall in behind the government. So, um, I mean, uh, you, the, and that, I, that, I think that's... I agree with Gavin on this. I think it, it would probably have helped a resolution one way or another. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a split in the Conservative Party. Yeah. And going back to the point about how parties hold together, I think that's really true. 
Um, you know, I mean, we saw that. We, 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 we saw that earlier. Well, I think it was, it was during this period, actually. We don't really cover it in the book, where there was a point at which, <laughs> yes, after the confidence vote in Corbyn, I wrote a blog post speculating on whether the Labour Party could split and what procedurally would be required for the Labour Party to split in two and what would happen to the second largest party in the Commons and so on. But the Labour Party had ultimately a cohesiveness that you know, would not allow that to happen. And I think similar things are happening on the Conservative side. But the people who don't share that ultimate commitment to cohesiveness are the ERG, actually. And another interviewee, I may have played this to you, Gavin, at one point, possibly when I interviewed you, um, somebody else who was close to Theresa May said to me that she was such a, you know, people commented how much, so much on the importance of the party to her, the extent to which she was a party loyalist, you know, she was a public servant, she was, you know, committed to the public, but also very committed to the party. Uh, and this person said to me that what the rebels did, she simply could not conceive. She could not conceive that people would be that disloyal. Um, and so she was trying to hold the party together, but other people weren't. Interesting. There's a wonderful clip. We did a in conversation with Rory Stewart in the heart of this 2018, 2019. And there's a wonderful clip when just talking about the whip system breaking down, where he recalls being in the lobbies and having no earthly clue what he was voting for or against. And he just said, sort of very, mem very memorably, he said. By that time, you couldn't do what you used to do, which is to look around and see if you were surrounded by your friends, because all those lines had gone. You know, you might be next to Jeremy Corbyn, you might be next to John. You had no idea what was going on, and it was—it was, it was a wonderful sort of illustration of how the the system was was creaking at the seams. Right, I'm going to turn to some of your questions now. Do keep voting for the ones on Slido. Actually, I tell you what, because there's people glaring at me. How many people here can't? or would rather not use Slido, but might have a, just get a sense of, oh, relatively few. Okay, so we might, we might, okay, brilliant. Would it have been better had the referendum been explicitly advisory, if that had been made clearer, then Parliament had very clearly been given the duty of sorting out whatever came out of it? Can I have a go? Uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I think there are, there are two possibilities. If, if you had had a, an advisory referendum, or indeed, if you'd fixed uh, a minimum threshold, mm. so you needed to get 60%. I think you would have had a high and relieved vote in that scenario, um, but you may still not have had um, a, a sufficient number to meet the threshold. I think that would have been quite an interesting discipline on a government mm -hmm. charged with trying to yep. secure some actual significant change as opposed to the sort of nugatory reforms that David Cameron came back with and said, look what I've got. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think it would have been a very interesting scenario. And, you know, I guess probably most of us were not instinctively keen on referendum as a, mm -hmm. a means of making uh, decisions. Uh, it was some, somewhere where we ended up. Um, That's such an so, ominous sound, that BBC headline. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, it would have been, would have been very... <laughs> Referendum was advisory, technically. Yeah. I mean, um, it was for Parliament to decide how to implement it, but I just think, so I, I am absolutely in the category that Lisa talked about. So I, I, I wasn't someone who favoured leaving. I, I was someone who supported having a referendum um, and having campaigned for a man. I very strongly believed that Parliament was obligated to do to vote in line with what the public have voted as a, as a matter of simple democratic principle. Um, and actually, my job, and Graham, Graham will know this very well, my job was quite difficult because I'd been on the Remain side. Mm. Um, because I think once, once Theresa's solution became unpopular with at least a significant chunk of Leave Sporting MPs, the fact that her chief of staff was from the Remain wing of the party didn't help her. Mm. It certainly didn't help me in terms of persuade someone. Um, so no, I don't. I don't. And I, and I, I don't also like referenda where you've got to get sixty percent because if I mean, you know, if you get a result that's well, if you get fifty-two, forty-eight, and then you say the forty-eight win, mm -hmm. that just doesn't that doesn't strike me as a kind of tenable issue. What I think is a more interesting question is whether the legislation could have required leave to set out some basic parameters about what re the relationship would be afterwards, because that would have helped a lot. If if the leave campaign had said we're campaigning for this kind of Brexit. Mm -hmm. 
it would have been much harder for those MPs that were trying to argue for a second referendum to say people weren't clear what they were voting for. Um, but whether the, whether the Leave campaign would easily have been able to do that, I don't know, because they probably within that within the within the people that were campaigning for Leave, there were probably a range of views about the kind of Brexit that they wanted. Yeah. Advisory. I take quite a simplistic view of this. I think it's very hard to explain to people that some votes are binding and some votes are advisory when they go into a, into a kind of polling station. Um, I think you know, the, the real force behind the referendum was always political rather than legal. And I think you know, attempting to badge it as advisory probably wouldn't really have changed that. Mm. Now, I think Graham is right that if, if David Cameron has said, uh, tell us what you think, it's only advisory, the Leave vote would have been much higher. Um, and I don't think that was the key problem. I think the key problem was, whether it was advisory or not, it was on a principle. It wasn't on a prospectus. So the decision was we should leave. But what did that mean? You know, all of these things that we've been talking about here that dominated afterwards, the customs union, the single market, the Northern Ireland border, et cetera, et cetera, weren't talked about very much in the campaign. Um, and there certainly wasn't a settled view as to what Brexit should look like. Um, which was the fundamental error, I think. Um, you know, people should have been asked to vote on a prospectus. Once that error had been made, I think there was another error which followed, um, which was that Theresa May, who does come in for some stick in the book, which is just unfortunate because she was the sad person who happened to be in the position of Prime Minister, which was an impossible job. You know, I'm not sure that many people would have done a lot better. They would have made different <laughs> mistakes, uh, but I don't think they would have failed to make mistakes or find it, find it hard. Um, said Brexit means Brexit and went off privately to try and negotiate something, rather than turning to the public and saying, look, you're, you've been split 48-52. This is really hard. We don't really know what this means. We've got to start having a conversation about what this means. How do we want to interpret this result? Um, she pretended it was easy when it was really, really hard. It maybe was because she didn't realise how hard it was. And if there'd been a more open conversation with Parliament, with the public, about how to interpret the result, it might not have got quite as nasty as it did, because it enabled other people to pretend that it was simple when it wasn't. The only thing I disagree with that, Meg, is that I think if we'd moved more quickly, it would actually have been easier. Because the longer it went on, the more people who thought that they could stop mm. it completely decided that they were right and started to put more and more effort into that. I mean, would it have made a material difference then if someone who had back leave, thought about leaving, had some ideas about leave, had become prime minister mm. in summer of 2016? In, in a sense, I mean, viewed from the outside, I sometimes got the impression that Mrs May was learning about Brexit and the EU on the job, whereas actually, you know, there were people who were steeped in this. There were people who had spent years arguing about this, who's, you know, this was their mission. Yes, but I mean, I said earlier, when I, when I saw what the initial withdrawal agreement was, it was obvious it wasn't going to get through. Uh, but clearly, Theresa didn't, re I didn't, didn't think that or didn't realise that. I think she knew it was going to be incredibly difficult to get it through. I think she thought it was the best deal that was available. And actually, the, the, the third vote, there are a few tweaks here and there. It's not fundamentally changed. And actually, Boris's deal goes back to something that Parliament had voted 100%, you know, literally every MP had said, we will not accept a border down the Irish Sea. Yeah. And then we accepted it. <laughs> um, so... You know, it's the, 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 I, the thing, the criticism of, that I have the most sympathy with, that I say this in my book, is that if at the start you've done a white paper saying, here are the options, mm. and tried to kill off the unicorns and sort of said, mm. the, because the, I mean, in my own view, obviously I'm biased because I, I didn't favour the decision in the first place, but my own view is there's no, there's no option which, is, which doesn't have any downsides, if I can put it that. All of them have got different problems with them. And it's about the balance you favour between, A, um, having the maximum possible freedom to do what we want, which to a degree is the purpose of leaving, B, um, the sort of economic friction at the UK EU border and what damage you think that might do or has done, and C, how you deal with the particular issues in Northern Ireland. And, and the, the mm. configuration between those three things drives the different possible options. And, and of course, in, in just shameless plug, in, in 2017, the Constitution Unit ran a citizens' assembly on Brexit, which Anand came and uh, spoke out more than once, and, and Graham came and spoke out, because it was held in your constituency, I think, wasn't it, in Manchester? Um, and that group of people who were representative of the population, you know, 52, 48, um, were told, right, we're doing Brexit, what shall we do? And they were confronted with all of these trade-offs, 
and they decided that we should have a soft Brexit. So actually, if we'd had that conversation, that is where we might well have ended up. So one of the most remarkable moments of the whole Brexit period for me was at this uh, citizens' assembly where this lady, who must have been in her 70s, came sort of wandering over to me at tea time and sort of took me to one side and said, I want to talk to you about something. And she said, I'm really concerned about these Henry VIII powers that... Uh, <laughs> and I thought, this is what Brexit has done to the British people. A perfectly <laughs> ordinary lady from sort of the Northwest is concerned about Henry VIII powers, which was uh, quite striking. Just going back to what uh, you were saying about uh, uh, Johnson's deal, I've got a question on Slido, Meg, from Alistair Burt. You have little faith. Uh, did you know or did you suspect that he would renege, in a sense, on what he'd agreed to after signing up to? Was that, I mean, you hear all these stories that it was people were going around Parliament saying, don't worry, we'll sort it out yeah. afterwards. Uh, did you think that? Were you told that? I, th I, mean, I think that that's pretty much where we were at that point. Uh, because of the, all that had gone before, mm. uh, there was just almost a desperation to, to clear the decks and move on to something else. And, you know, I think a, a lot of people were um, of that view. But let's just do it. Uh, predictably, I was pretty cross about it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's worth going back and looking at what he said at mm -hmm. the Conservative conference in 2018. So he resigned over Chequers by that point, yep. and he was fairly openly militating to bring Theresa down. And what he said to the party was, we don't have to have a Northern Ireland Protocol at all. If I'm in charge, we can hard ball these people, it can all be made to go away, we can just, the whole UK can leave cleanly. And what he discovered was that wasn't bad. Now, you can slightly, I think if he was here, he would say, well, Parliament passed this legislation and it weakened my negotiating position. Um, <coughs> probably, you could probably look at you at that point, Alistair. Um, but ultimately, you know, all of the things that we warned about if you did this version of Brexit, both in terms of what it would mean economically, UK, EU, and what it would mean for the integrity of the United Kingdom, for the Good Friday agreement institutions, all of that has come to pass. Everything that Theresa warned about at the dispatch box about what that version of Brexit would mean. Now, I, I, can, I entirely understand Greg's point, that at that point everyone was so desperate to get out of the logjam that we've been stuck in, that mm. it was almost, this is, this, is what, this is the thing that's left on the table now and therefore this is gonna have to be it. Though there is a bit of me that thinks, you know, would that the EU had been as flexible about borders then, as it has become in the last few weeks. No. I mean, no. you know, you know. So what, I mean, I think there's several things that have clearly changed, I and mean, if we want to understand why the situation has changed, one is the, the fir one of the first things Rishi Sunak did, which was a very sensible decision, was to start sharing the live customs data with the EU, yep. which David Frost had refused to do. Yeah, yeah. And the moment you do that, they can see that the risk to the single market is less than they thought it was. So that mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. Then I think the other thing, and you know, depending on how you view the EU, you can spin this negatively as they were trying to punish us for leaving, but the, the reality in 2017 is that they viewed Brexit as an existential threat to yeah. them. They were worried that other countries might follow our example, and they had a US president who was sort of openly encouraging other countries to do that. Yeah. Um, with the, without wanting to offend Graham sitting to my left, I think it's fair to say today they're not so worried that people are going to think other people might want to copy our example. <laughs> <laughs> so that the concern, they, the, the risk that they see to Brexit, I think, has shifted as well. And then I think the, um, the sort of change in negotiating approach from the, from the Johnson Trust era to Sunak has clearly paid dividends here. Rishi and James mm -hmm. Cleverly have properly engaged with them, got mastery of the detail, and done a good job. Did you want to come back on any of that? Well, I just thought, uh, the, the last point, uh, I wholeheartedly agree, and I thought the most interesting thing at the press conference uh, on the Windsor framework was you could see there was a degree of rapport, yeah. and Ursula von der Leyen was uh, uh, clearly quite enjoying being in the company of the Prime Minister and they were working together. And you know, it shouldn't really have been that difficult. Ukraine's helped a little bit as well. Yeah. Because it's reminded both sides that actually yes. they've got shared interests yeah. in some things. I mean, Alistair, as the Benber Act has been mentioned, is there anything you'd like you'd like to say about what Boris Johnson might have said? I mean, you know, that argument is you hear that over and over again. Boris Johnson would have said anything in order to become Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I, I, I'm not saying that as a joke. It's quite clear. And he wanted to be Prime Minister from the moment he was made Foreign Secretary, which was an astonishing decision. 
and, um, and, and he was fixated on that. He would have said anything to, to hold that position. I think the thing that hurts the Conservatives who paid a penalty for standing by the things they believe is that when you talk about holding the party together, you're absolutely right. For the majority of Conservatives, that is a, a fundamental. But there was a group who just didn't care. And it was, as, as both Graham and Gavin have said, this was so overriding. They did not care if they destroyed the Conservative Party in the process in order to achieve their objective. And Boris Johnson was quite happy to ride that particular tiger because that would give him what he wanted. And then the duplicity that we've all looked through from prorogation to what was said about Northern Ireland hasn't just damaged the Conservative Party, it's damaged politics hugely. And we're having to live with that. And what the Ben Burt Act said was that we shouldn't leave without a deal. It didn't bind anyone's hands. It just ensured that we got a deal. And that is how we left, with the deal. So we were right. And the damage that was done in the process to, to try and turn that the surrender act which they are still talking about. Mr. Frost in the House of Lords still refers to it as the Surrender Act. I think Boris did recently as well. And the damage that's done has been huge. So I think the party has suffered greatly through this process. Mm -hmm. I hope an enormous number of lessons have been learned so that we never get in this position again. But, but the fundamentals of offering something to the public that is not entirely true uh, should be learned by all. Uh, and it should carry through politics to make sure we never do anything like that again. Great, but you know, <laughs> I, I can be on saying that as from our very old friends, uh, uh, but I, uh, I'm not even allowed to draw me into okay. territory too dangerous. Okay, perfect. <laughs> We've got a question from Tim Bale, who, if you didn't know, also has a book coming out <laughs> on the Conservative <laughs> Party. Uh, and it's, it's aimed at you, Gavin, but I mean, any of you, I mean, and the question is, how much of a hindrance was the Tory press, and how much of a difference would it have made had the Telegraph, the Mail, and the Express rode in behind uh, the Prime Minister earlier than they did? Um, and did you try and persuade them? We, we obviously yeah. tried to persuade them. <laughs> um, and actually, as, as you were saying, actually there were, there were moments where both the Mail and the Sun were quite helpful. Mm. Um, you know, I think that they were not... Um, they recognised that this was difficult and some kind of compromise was being. They were the, the Telegraph was harder over, but the, the Mail and the Sun, I think, were not uniformly unhelpful. Um, I'm not. I don't think I want to get into the business of criticising newspapers. I think they have a right to determine their editorial. No, it's a question of how much that it weighed so, on you all. Yeah. So, so obviously, when you're in when you're in number ten and you're under a huge amount, huge amount of pressure. Having some, having some cheerleaders in the newspaper that are behind what you're trying to do is incredibly helpful. Um, I think that our, our papers had a kind of, they had a way that they liked to see British Prime Ministers deal with Europe, yeah. which was the sort of Margaret Thatcher handbag treatment. So yeah. the best press Theresa ever got, if you, I can't remember exactly which European Council it was, but it was the one where essentially Tusk rejected checkers and was quite rude to the Prime Minister. Uh, Salzburg. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the sort of sharing his photo afterwards. And yeah, yeah, the Instagram. Yeah, she gave a really strong statement the next day and got incredibly good press in the UK press for it. Um, and colleagues, I think, really yep. appreciated seeing her taking a robust position. Um, and actually, it worked reasonably well with her, even at a European level, because I think some of the heads of government felt that Tusk had gone too far. Um, so I suppose that I, I suppose that's our, our press liked that style of how to negotiate with Europe, where Theresa's natural instincts were actually to get in the room, go through all the detail, try and you know, she, I mean, beyond, beyond the all of the sort of policy arguments about Brexit, which everyone in this room will be familiar with, the real difference between Theresa May and Boris Johnson, I would say, is philosophical, which is that Theresa's view was that a compromise was required, that the country, the country had voted to leave, mm -hmm. but it had voted 52-48, and she was also a very strong conviction unionist, and two of the four nations of the United Kingdom had voted to remain, and two had voted to leave. Mm -hmm. So her, her view was the right answer was some kind of compromise. Whereas Boris, and if I try and, I try and put his point of view rather than my view here, I think would say, there's no point doing this thing unless you do it properly. The whole idea of a compromise on Brexit is, is nonsense. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna do something where you don't break fully free of the gravitational pull of the EU, you may as well stay in. 
in, and not bother doing the whole thing at all. So there was this kind of philosophical difference, and, and probably maybe there are kind of, I mean, listening to Alastair speak, and obviously I, I tend to lean more to his view, but I think probably the RG would sort of say that, that his wing was kind of endangering the Conservatives. But it, was, it was about whether conservatism is in its nature kind of pragmatic and seeks a compromise, or whether there was a kind of, this was an ideological project that people had voted for and had to be followed through properly. And it was, it was a philosophical difference as much mm. as a sort of clash on the detail of the policy. You, on, the, on, the, on the media, you didn't, you didn't come back in your remarks on the comment that I made when I read those headlines after the second defeat. It felt like those newspapers, it was the Sun and the Mail, wasn't it, had kind of got to the position that Graham was talking about, the thing that David Frost articulated later, that the fear that Brexit was about to be lost if the deal was on, on the table yes. wasn't grasped, they got there quicker. And that's essentially what they were saying after the second vote. And yet, the Prime Minister, the noises from the government were not... You, you didn't... You, you know, falling in behind the sun is maybe the wrong way to put it when you're the Prime Minister, but you know what I mean? You didn't take that political opportunity to say, yes, actually, it's those people who are not voting for it, so, and so they was, are threatening Brexit. She was definitely making that argument to them privately. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the difficulty of the situation was it wasn't clear if the May deal fell it wasn't clear what would happen it wasn't clear if actually Johnson would take over Philip Hammond Amber Rudd, Alistair Burt would all, Alistair Burt would all give in and go, and go behind his attempt to kind of threaten no deal and see if he could get a better deal out of it or if actually a majority would assemble in Parliament in favour of a second referendum and at the point when you're going through those second and third votes None of us knew which of those two outcomes might happen. Um, and therefore, yeah, and I can remember, I think I say in my book, there was this meeting in number 10 in the study that I had with seven or eight colleagues from, I had, I had a few who had voted for the deal, I had a, three or four who had not voted for it on the sceptical side, and I had one who had not voted for it wanting a second referendum. And essentially, I sort of said, look, if we don't come together and unite and get behind something, this is going to end very badly, and it's going to end one of these two ways. So you're either going to end up with a kind of no deal exit, or you're going to end up with a second referendum. And almost simultaneously, the people who hadn't voted for the deal went, yes, and you're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't, no one could agree on what that kind of outcome would be. But you're right, what you're saying, Meg, is that she didn't, Theresa's instincts were never to attack colleagues in public. Mm. She didn't want to, I mean, actually, one of the reasons that she struggled in the 2017 election, you showed that clip of Yvette saying, well, why are you calling it? Because Parliament hasn't blocked Article 50. She knew that with the very small majority that she had inherited from David Cameron, she wouldn't be able to get a deal through on Conservative votes because either it would be too hard for Ken Clark or it would be too soft for Marcus Fish, to pick two random examples. <laughs> um, but she couldn't very well come before you in the general election and say, look, I've got this real problem. Some of my team are a bit unreliable, so I need you to vote for some more Conservative MPs so that this is going to be a bit yeah, simpler. Yeah. And so she was then advised, we'll do the whole strong and stable thing. And she, what Theresa's actually quite good at communicating when she passionately believes in something. What she's not great at selling is something someone's told her to say that isn't really what she feels. Arnold, may I make a supportive point of information here? No. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> if we've got time, we'll come back to you, but just for the moment, because we're in the okay. middle of something. Um, well, I'd just come back quickly on the press. I think one of the things that is interesting is how far... Um, how far the press operate as a venue for a particular part of the argument. Um, because as Meg and I kind of you know, spent many hours trawling Hansard records, one of the things that you do see as you go through 2019 in particular is that the ERG effectively stopped turning up to parliamentary debates because they know they're not going to um, have a particularly supportive audience in the Commons. You know, the numbers are generally against them. And actually, they don't need to build a majority. Um, I think the only, the only people in the story who don't have to build a majority are the ones who are happy to contemplate leaving without a deal because that is the default outcome that Article 50 leaves you with. So as long as you can block other things, that's OK. Uh, but it does mean that you have this like slightly um, unbalanced use of kind of different venues at some points where you have some MPs in the chamber you know, trying frantically to put together a majority for the customs union, and you have others who are very much fighting the media battle you know, in the press, and they're almost not talking to one another at points. It's like the UK and the EU, the expert at the blocking minority. But uh, <laughs> Graham, did you want to come in on the press at all? Or? No. You don't? Okay. 
Uh, I've got a question from Linda, which we've touched on, but I want to come back to it in part because you and Meg said very different things. I want to get, I want to get into that argument. It's a question from Linda who says, one, was Brexit engineered to keep the Tory party together? You kind of implied yes, you kind of implied no. And do you think it will succeed in doing so over the next decade? Well, I think that, um, I think we've seen in the last few weeks that the, um, the party is ready to move mm -hmm. on and take a, uh, and has welcomed broadly the progress that yeah. Rishi Sunak achieved. Uh, and clearly the Windsor framework isn't perfect, but it's a big improvement on the protocol that went before. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think most people have been pragmatic and accepted that and, and welcomed it. And of course it's not necessarily the end position. Um, but I, you know, I think it's fair to say I have many um, Northern Irish friends, and I love Northern Ireland very much, but Northern Ireland isn't always front and centre of um, everybody's minds in, in British mm -hmm. politics. Uh, so you know, I, I think having a quite a good settlement there uh, will allow things to move on and for us to concentrate on other things. So do you think this is the moment when the Tory party has finally stopped banging on about Europe? Do you think we've reached... I think pretty much. And right, you know, okay. I, mean, I, I was shadow Euro Minister when David Cameron said we should mm -hmm. stop banging on about Europe. And I usually say that I was the one person who had uh, an exemption. I think we, uh, we are probably largely there now. And you know, I, I think it's worth saying that for a lot of us uh, who you know, maybe were uh, always Eurosceptic, uh, but um, probably were wary of a referendum, uh, and you know, when, when I was Shadow Europe Minister, our policy was an incremental return of competencies, mm -hmm. uh, which I'd far rather have done. Uh, it was the coalition government that had no interest in pursuing that agenda that um, I think helped to increase the, the, the pressure. But for a lot of us who uh, wanted a different accommodation with the EU, whatever it might be, part of the objective was to get to a position where we could have a more uh, mature um, um, generous dialogue with our neighbours where we weren't always the ones who were dragging our heels saying we don't want to go there uh, and we could actually just be friends and partners and cooperate and you know I did you know, for me I, I thought it was very powerful watching that press conference on the Windsor mm -hmm. framework and it was just like the visible embodiment of that happening and mm -hmm. it was a very welcome change interesting Tory party either of you were you hiding there, Meg? And I think, was it engineered um, to keep the Tory party together? In a yeah. sense, I mean, it was, you say that it was, it was us who started that. I think it was engineered, as, as Lisa said, uh, if you mean the referendum. Hmm. It was engineered to sideline the hardliners and to keep the Tory party together by sidelining the hardliners. And it failed, clearly, because... Um, because the, the result was not the one that David Cameron had been expecting. And the parliament afterwards, you know, the referendum result obviously needed to be, needed to be delivered. Uh, and in the, in the minority situation, those people wound up absolutely pivotal, um, absolutely pivotal to um, being able to get anything through. Rishi Sunak has sort of gone back to that position of being able to sideline the hardliners, I think. But it's the luxury that he's got for having the majority. I mean, partly it's his political skill, I'm, I'm sure, but he's also in a much more comfortable position in Parliament than Theresa May was. Um, she wasn't able to do that. So I would, um, so two thoughts on this. I would say, to a degree, it was engineered to, to see off the challenge of UKIP. Yeah. The 2015 yeah. election. Yeah. 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 Um, and if that seems a sort of ignoble reason to hold a referendum, and I think that is that is sort of raw politics. Um, and I was, you know, I was in a marginal seat. I was very clear that if UKIP got ten percent of the vote, I would lose my seat. Other people in similar seats would lose their seats. Mm -hmm. David Cameron wouldn't be prime minister anymore. Um, I think, in terms of the future, that's a quite interesting question. So I think Graham is definitely right that for this has sort of settled the argument for now. And the party is, the vast majority of the party is happy behind, even if they don't think it's perfect, where Rishi has got things. I think what happens in the future really depends on where public opinion goes. I mean, if you look at the UK, uh, the UK tracker poll, there's quite significant Brexit regret without that being a majority to rejoin. Mm -hmm. um, so my view is if there's a change of government, you're going to end up 
not back in the single market or the customs union, but with a closer relationship than the current one. And that will, the Conservative Party will then have to think about what it feels about that, and it will depend how public opinion develops on this question over time, essentially. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's settled it long term. I'll have to see how that evolves. Just, I mean, just on this, because of course there's another big legislative moment coming with the retained EU law bill. Are you implying that you think... I mean, all the indications are that the Prime Minister is, is going to stall with this, or at least push, gonna, stall, or at least push back the sort of sunset to 2026 so it's out of the way, isn't happening now. Is, is your hunch that he'll be able to manage that relatively easily as well, or is that a battle waiting to happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult judgment. I think that, um, going back to some of the things we were talking about earlier, it's also true that the closer you get to a general election, the more likely parties are to pull together. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, the, you know, the more time passes, the, the more the pressure is to, to do that. But it doesn't mean it's not a, not a tricky issue. Uh, the, the other thing I was just going to throw into the pot on, uh, on the referendum was um, uh, the question of whether the result of the 2015 general election was the one that David Cameron anticipated. Mm. And you know, it's not entirely possible he didn't think he was necessarily going to have to. Um, yeah, honour the pledge. <laughs> I, think, I think he also probably would have thought that if there was a referendum, he'd have a Labour Party led by someone who was unambiguously pro Remain. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think he also miscalculated about which side Boris Johnson would be on in a referendum. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Lisa, do you want to. Uh, no, that's. Hang on, I'm completely side-footed by this. Uh, there's a couple of, there's quite a lot of questions on Theresa May, uh, and w one of which is, and you often read this, and I think it's sort of hinted at in the book, which is when she set, gave the Lancaster House speech, and there were lots of sort of hostages to fortune in that speech, were her and her team absolutely clear of the implications of what they were saying? I mean. Had this been properly thought through, or was this just a slightly sort of naive positioning for political and internal reasons? That wasn't meant to sound like it. Very much like I mean, it's, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I wasn't working yeah. for it at that point. Mm. Yeah. So, so, my own view is that I don't think there are huge hostages to fortune in Lancaster House. I think if you read back Lancaster House, mm -hmm. She certainly had to compromise a bit on it. I think that the speech that is more problematic is the conference, conference speech. speech yeah. mm. The conference speech, yeah. And I, and I have a lot of... So whilst, whilst I, you know, if, if I had been there, I think I would have toned that down a bit. I have a lot of sympathy for why it was done. And, and you touched on it very well, I thought, in your introduction, which is you had this leadership election, and essentially Boris Johnson and Michael Gove took each other out, and then Andrea Leadsom took herself out. And so Theresa became leader without really having to fight a contested election. And if she, if, if let's say, it, it probably, I don't know what you think, probably would have been Boris versus Theresa. Yeah. If, if, the, if, if, if those events hadn't happened, I think that probably would have been the runoff. And then one of two things would have happened. Either he would have beaten her and she would have been a senior minister in his government or if she'd won, she would have had authority with the party and the parliamentary party for having mm -hmm. defeated him in front of the membership. So I think it was perfectly natural that having won the leadership in the way that she had, and having campaigned, albeit without, not in a sort of George Osborne way, for Remain in the referendum, she felt the need in that conference speech to reassure Brexiteers that she understood the things that were important to them. So I can see why it was done, but I think what Graham said in his introduction, paraphrasing him, is right, which is that that built up a, a level of expectation that she was then measured against by that one of the party. Anyone else want to come in? Uh, I'll come in, yeah. So, so I think one of the, um, one of, one of the sort of very tricky things um, in the post-referendum period is that essentially the government is confronted with an enormous trade negotiation, which is not something the government is used to doing because for the last 40 years the EU had done it for us. Um, and that, that is immensely difficult. I think if there was a slowness to recognise something in particular, and I mean it's not specifically about Theresa May but about this period, it's to really understand how difficult Northern Ireland was going to be and how much of a challenge the border was going to be. And you can trace that back to the campaign. It's one of the things we try, we sort of try to outline the absence of it, if, if that makes sense, um, uh, in the book, that you know, there were a small handful of people who, who tried to draw attention to this, but actually 
you know, UK politics is in general used to ignoring Northern Ireland. It was very difficult for mm. that to get traction, and it's only really later that people start to understand just how far this is going to drive the whole story. We also do an analysis of the debates, don't we, on the referendum bill. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and Northern Ireland, the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland is, is never mentioned. Northern Ireland is only ever used with respect to the date of the election and whether it's going to clash with the dates of the Northern Ireland mm. Assembly elections or some yeah. such. And Article 50, I think, in those entire debates is mentioned once by Cheryl Gillan, who was one person who did understand it. Uh, and, you know, if, 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 if the triggering of Article 50 had been written into the referendum bill, that a lot of nuisance could have been saved on the other side of the referendum. Uh, but even that wasn't done in terms of having a plan. OK, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I want to end, as I always like to, with an absurdly broad question, which is, <laughs> you know, what, what are the long-term political consequences of the Brexit process, do you think? You know, to what, how has Brexit and how will Brexit shape our politics going forward? That's it. That's all there is to it. That's a nice big question. <laughs> Well, we have some stuff on the conclusions of the book on this, so Lisa, why don't you go first? Um, well, I'm going to start, actually, before I go into our conclusions, I'll give a slightly sort of political scientist cheating answer and say, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, but not, not least because I... Boo hiss. Not least because as soon as we left the European Union, we went straight into COVID. Yeah. Um, so that it's actually you know, only fairly recently that we're getting enough of a period of normality to try and work out whether normality has changed. Um, yeah. I, think, I think there are some lasting consequences. Um, public trust in institutions took a real knock. Um, and I think that is a serious problem, um, yeah, both because people observed the, the gridlock and the difficulties in the Commons, and because yeah, at various points for various political reasons, um, you know, some people did you know, set out to criticise Parliament and, as we lay out, to, to blame Parliament as an institution mm -hmm. for the political difficulties that were taking place inside it. I'll hand over to Meg to... And I mean, we've said some of this in some of your publications earlier, Anand, in your in important UK and Changing Europe reports. And I remember the... Visit the one, our website. The one, that we did on, the one that we did on Brexit in Parliament had a fantastic chapter by John Curtis in yeah. it with some public opinion stuff on attitudes to Parliament and attitudes to the courts and the extent to which those, you know, everything had become polarised along, mm. uh, along Brexit lines. We know from uh, Sarah Hobalt's research that, you know, even who people are prepared to see marrying into their families is, is, is polarised along Brexit lines, but attitudes to the courts and attitudes to Parliament are polarised along Brexit lines. So, you know, the Supreme Court rules yeah. against the prorogation. <laughs> if you're a Remainer, you love the Supreme Court. If you're a Leaver, you hate the Supreme Court. This is really, really unhealthy because our institution should not be politicised in that, in that way. Um, and the other lasting impact, which we do draw attention to in the conclusion, which is connected to COVID as well as uh, Brexit, is that the standards of scrutiny in Parliament have enormously declined. The expectations of scrutiny, particularly in the government, uh, the government's expectations of what it can get away with, I think Brexit, minority government, COVID and Boris Johnson have all conspired to make the government increasingly resistant to what we would previously have considered to be appropriate and healthy standards of parliamentary scrutiny. And we need to pull that back. Well, I'd rather agree with that, but I also um, though start from a more pessimistic place than Meg on that, because if she knows I've always thought that our parliamentary scrutiny was far worse than she does. <laughs> um, but um, so I think we probably started from a lower lower okay. banks uh, than, uh, than might be implied. I mean, my view is that I think ever since the Maastricht Treaty, the creation of the Euro, the Eurozone of only some of the member states, uh, and at the same time the creation of qualified majority voting, I think it was inevitable that at some point there would be a fracture, because mm. we were never going to go uh, where the central group, uh, the inner group of the, the EU was going to. So I, I, I hope that part of the outcome, as I said earlier, will be having resolved that tension, we can now get on with our neighbours and cooperate with them in a sensible way. Uh, and you know, I think if we can see this as less of an issue in British politics for the foreseeable future as well, I think that'll be a thoroughly positive development. Um, so I, I think there's probably three things that I would pick out. There, there was, there's a realignment that's been going on in our politics for about 20 years. And Brexit is both a symptom of that realignment, but also catalyzed it. Mm -hmm. um, and interesting questions about whether that 
will begin to unwind on it. There's a few maybe tentative signs, but that's yeah. definitely something worth looking yeah. um, I think I think it has an interesting and perhaps paradoxical impact on the debate in Scotland. Because in one way, emotionally, the sort of fairly hard Brexit that we've ended up with strengthens those the case of those people that think, well, you know, I voted, I voted to stay in the UK because the UK was in the EU and now it's not, it strengthens the case for independence. Mm -hmm. But I think it also teaches voters in Scotland that breaking up these kinds of unions is not a simple, painless process um, and, and has injected a degree of wariness about what that might involve if you go down that road. Um, for the Conservative Party, I mean, I think time, time will tell. Um, clearly, sort of short to medium term, it has led to the driving out of the party of Alastair and a number of other colleagues I had a very high regard for, <coughs> to the detriment of the party, to the detriment of the government as it tried to manage the country through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the long-term question, I think, depends upon whether Graham is right that actually now things kind of settle down and actually the country can fall into a sort of happy relationship with its neighbours outside or whether you think public opinion is going to increasingly take the view that we made a mistake, in which case the Conservative Party is in grave danger that it's kind of driven itself down a sort of electoral alley, essentially. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's too soon to say that for certain. Um, but you know, I think there is a very strong age skew on this question, if you look at British public opinion at the moment. Now, when it comes to voting intention, people tend to sort of drift in a slight centre-right, most people drift in a slight centre-right direction as they get a bit older. So maybe people's attitudes to relations with the EU will prove to be like that. But if, if they don't, then you know, this, this issue may not be um, resolved. Mm. And it could, be, it could be incredibly challenging for the party if it ends up... You know, it, it could end up almost like the sort of unilateral disarmament was for Labour, which is you, your voter base your core vote very strongly believes in what you've done. So it's very hard for you to move away from that position because yeah. you'd actually probably lose votes initially from doing that. But, but that, the, the core of people that believe in that is not enough to win an election. That could, no, I'm not saying it will end up there, but that is a possible um, future in terms of how this issue could develop politically. And I think, a lot, a lot, I think ultimately it will depend economically on how the UK economy performs. You know, we have quite good news to give, say something positive. We have quite a good news story today in terms of the... Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Mm -hmm. So, if over time the UK economy picks up and doesn't look like it's underperforming relatively, then maybe public opinion softens a bit and it settles down in the way Graham said. Well, well, we also had higher growth in France or Germany since 2010. So. Yeah. So, but I mean, if you look at the FT piece, it's pretty clear that we had we had the highest growth in the G7 2010 to 2016, and we've been second lowest since. Now, that's not just Brexit; it's also pandemic and it's the turbulence we've had in our politics. It's unreasonable to suggest it's all that's all down to Brexit. But I'm afraid um, I've run badly over. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to spend the night practicing how to say CPTPP <laughs> uh, without getting it wrong. So <laughs> without further ado, several things to say. Firstly, look out for our forthcoming events, including an event to launch the book that I might have mentioned that Tim Bale has uh, written. If you want advance notice about any events we have, do sign up to our newsletter. Let me end by saying congratulations to Meg and Lisa on writing such a fantastic book, which you can buy just outside the door. And many, many thanks to Graham and Gavin. I think this has been a real, I mean, we could have gone on for ages. This was, I thought it was just utterly fascinating, but thank you all for participating. Thank you all for coming. Hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thanks.